what it's about, but I can't wait to hear. So I want to thank everyone for coming out on a Sunday in June on a full moon to come and see. There he is, Brother Peter Moon. Come up here. All right. So thank you very much. It's very nice to be here. Um, I'm going to uh, pass around a couple of my recent newsletters. I have a subscription newsletter, and I'm going to pass around. I uh, hope I have enough copies for everybody. I got the yellow one, which is recent, and uh, the gold one, which is a little older. Um, but try and make sure everybody gets at least one newsletter. Just uh, start passing these around. Okay, so as he said, uh, as Greg said, my name is Peter Moon, and I've been writing for about 18 years. And 18 years ago, I got my license to begin as a writer when I discovered something called the Montauk Project, um, which was a story, which we can call an urban legend, but it was being generated by Preston Nichols a scientist who had been involved in secret experiments on the eastern end of Long Island at Montauk Point. And I, he had incredible stories of mind control and experimentation with psychic energy that was parlayed into manipulation of time itself. These experiments are very exotic, they're very esoteric, and as they say, they, they remain an urban legend. However, there is substantial tentacles to what happened to establish that a Montauk project uh, of some place did, of some form did take place during the 70s and early 80s. And as I begin, I could spend a whole uh, long time talking about the details of the Montauk project, where it led, how it led, because we're dealing with actually manipulating time and space and stories of time travel, which are quite fantastic. And I'm not going to uh, linger on these subjects today, but that book catapulted me from an unknown person to instant recognition on what you would call the uh, conspiracy circuit that was quite large in the early 90s. And as I began to in, 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 I'm going to explain how the discovery and learning about time travel led me to connections with the indigenous Moorish or African community. Because when I began to try and study the Montauk Project to see if it actually took place, I discovered that the data trail was all shredded because, of course, we're dealing with top military intelligence region. But what I did find, I began to have incredible experiences of synchronicity or coincidence. And coincidence is a phenomenon of two things. When you get into the quantum realm, quantum meaning the underpinning of the physical plane, physical matter. When you get into the quantum realm, you begin to experience synchronicity. There was a scientist named Wolfgang Pauli who discovered the initial theories of, of quantum mechanics. And he was known to have weird coincidences happen around him that were called the Pauli effect. He teamed with a man named Carl Jung, who was a famous psychologist who rivaled and was sort of the antagonist of, of Sigmund Freud. And Carl Jung was very much into the occult and metaphysics. And he was a, a counselor of Wolfgang Pauli, and they worked together. And Jung points out the second important facet of synchronicity. As they say, it occurs in the, when you begin to get into the quantum realm or penetrate the quantum realm of consciousness. Jung said that synchronicity, and he's the one that coined the word in the English language, which is still not appear in the dictionary. Carl Jung said, even though it's a, he was German and he spoke English, he said that synchronicity was a poor substitute 
for what happened, as a word, as a poor substitute for what happens when you encounter the Tao. The T-A-O, or the Chinese sometimes spell it D-A-O, but it's pronounced Tao, which is the eternal way of the universe. I will get back to the Tao later on in the talk, but, but your, as you penetrate the eternal mystery of the universe, which is Chinese called the Tao, well, it's obviously related to quantum mechanics, and I began to penetrate this through research of an alleged time travel project. <coughs> now, how I what, I, what happened is I began to have many coincidences with certain occult realms, and one of the occult realms was the names Wilson and Cameron, who were very notorious occult families, although they're not famous to any significant extent, save for a man who was the head of the American Psychiatric Association during the 50s, Ewan Cameron. He was known as a butcher of people. He would you know, do lobotomies, he would shock people, he was a, a vicious, vicious man. And he was later um, recognized for doing these things, and an out-of-court settlement was made with a uh, institute in Canada, the Allen Memorial Institute, where he worked out with victims. But it was all done in Canada, it was done, uh, the CIA had their MK Ultra experiments where they were mind controlling people. Now it just so happens that one of the most, uh, what would you say, effective psychics in the Montauk Project was a guy named, a guy named Duncan Cameron, who was, I guess the, his father was the cousin of uh, Ewan Cameron. So there was this very sinister mind control connection to between the Camerons and the Montauk Project and mind control. Now I, I found out many synchronicities with this name Cameron, which eventually led me to a meeting with a very remarkable woman named Marjorie Cameron, who was part of a magical experiment that was conducted with her, a man you've heard of named Elvon Hubbard, who was the to be the future founder of Scientology, and Jack Parsons, who was a rocket scientist who helped found the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California, and he also devised the method by which we have the solid fuel rocket. Jack Parsons is most responsible for getting us to the moon and the space program because he developed the solid fuel rocket, which means you're using asphalt, which is a slow burn, as opposed to a fast burn. And as you get a long, slow, slow sustained burn, you can sort of take off as a rocket and get up and penetrate the atmosphere. So Jack Parsons was also an occultist. Now, because I was tracing occult synchronicities, I happened to, when I released my first book, The Montauk Project, I went to the book fair in Anaheim, California, where I was, by mysterious circumstances, led to a man who would introduce me to Marjorie Cameron on that trip, and I would meet her. And she was a very pivotal person in my research, because when I discovered her, I said, why did I come all this, follow this occult trail to meet you? And I told her about all my synchronicities with the name Wilson and Cameron, and she said, well, although my name is Cameron, I'm really a Wilson. My father was really a Wilson, and I was adopted and raised by my uncle, who was a Cameron. They just called me Cameron. They would call me that in the Navy, that my name stuck, uh, is basically known as Cameron. And she says, I became the, in this experiment, they wanted to incarnate the goddess Babylon. And she was a representative of the feminine energy. And what they were trying to do in this occult experiment, which most people equate to devil worship, was to reintroduce the feminine current into this culture, which Jack Parsons had believed that the Catholic Church and other such institutions were abusing their power through patriarchy. So he was trying to do this magical experiment which would bring back the goddess Babylon, who was not viewed in the biblical sense, but viewed as somebody who would bring back the feminine current and balance the energies of the earth in what we now call this new age phenomenon. So by circumstance, if not coincidence, in the 1970s, I worked for Elvin Hubbard. When I was 19, 
I graduated high school. I got involved with a local Scientology center in Davis, California, which was primarily a university town. And I, I had wonderful experiences in Scientology at that particular time, which was structured and run much differently than it is today. And in that center in Davis, I, and I was not, I was learning about metaphysics, but I, I had been primarily interested in sports up to that time in my life. And I don't only had intellectualism forced on me in living in a university town and going to school with uh, intelligent people. And I, I had a, a good mind, so, but it, I had to take a learning step to actually improve my intellect. And then I got involved in spiritual matters, mostly through science fiction. But I, I still thought I was just like a meathead, you know, somebody walking around in a body. Because that's kind of what you're growing up to expect to be, at least in the you know, Southern California culture where I grew up. So in Scientology, I began to learn that I was a spirit. And I actually had the phenomena of what they now call an out-of-body experience. They, today, back then, and they still do, they call it exteriorization, where you're going outside of your body. And that was a very wonderful experience where I was actually able to lift over my head and look down. And that set me on a course that this told me that the procedures of Scientology really work because I've been practicing them to relieve, I guess what you call the, um, psychosomatic ills, headaches, uh, sore throats that were psychosomatic in nature. And I had great results with this stuff. And I would help others with this as well. So I joined their most elite organization, which was called the Sea Organization. And I did not expect this. I did not requested. But after being in that organization for about a month, which was a very, I guess what you call, tough organization. It was like sort of like a spiritual boot camp because you were occupied most of the time and, or you were studying. And it was, it was meant to be tough. And after being in there about a month, and I thought I was performing very horribly, and I could substantiate that for you if we had time for the detail. I was not doing that well. But because I had, I guess, good test scores and whatnot, and wasn't and didn't have a criminal background and, and a heavy drug background, they decided to send me to their elite ship, which is where Elon Hubbard was, and it was called the Apollo. And this is very interesting because they don't tell you where the ship is. You can kind of assume it's in the Mediterranean because you've read news stories where he's coasting around the Mediterranean. So I'm flown over with instructions to report to Madrid, Spain at a certain address. And I met at the airport where I spend the night. And they said, do you know, guess where you're going? I said, I have no idea. The, Med the Mediterranean, they say, no, you're going to M Morocco. You're going to Casablanca. And Morocco would, have, would, of course, later play into my connection to Africa because I'm going to you know, what is it, Casablanca, and you're not, uh, it's a, 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 obviously Casablanca is a, is a completely different culture to anything we experience here, with women wearing their veils, and it's rather, you know, you're told not to look conspicuous, you're wearing western clothes, don't stand out, don't make trouble, just shut up and, you know, get to the ship. And it did not look like a safe place to be, certainly, as you go through on the bus, but I arrive at the ship, and, and that becomes a career for me. Um, and of course, eventually working for L. Ron Hubbard in his office. And of course, the interesting thing about L. Ron Hubbard was that he had devised, devised this procedures, which was called technology, to free the human spirit. Now, of course, if you have something that is purported to be is is, is either as good or is purported to be as good, you're going to have a lot of what I would call mysterious spiritual forces, which we can call jinn, that are there to stop you from getting there. So you had a lot of creepy, crawly people that were there trying to stop you or stop others from doing what we all might consider to be the right thing. So it was constantly being tested. And of course, he had an infrastructure around him, so he didn't have to put up with this stuff. At the same time, when I'd been there a few months, he was devising he had a procedure to, of interrogation, which would make all of this waterboarding completely nonsensical because you could use a what they call an e-meter, which is 
a biofeedback device to determine if somebody's lying or even determine where somebody is. You can find, even if they're not telling you the truth, you can use this. Uh, and he was had worked out a way so that the Moroccan security force could scrutinize people that were coming to work for the government. What Elmer Hubbard and his people did not know that the the head of the Moroccan security force, whose name was Colonel Alf Kior, was trying to take over the government. He had a, a, plot, a plot to assassinate the King of Morocco. And the King of Morocco, King Hassan II, he was in an airplane, and these two jet fighters from his own air force tried to shoot him down. And they penetrated the plane, and he, he went down. He just ducked, and he says, tell the pilot, he says, tell the pilot the king is dead. And they, the pilot radio to the jet fighters said, the king is dead. Don't worry, you got it. Just let me land. So they said, OK. The king had fooled them. And when the king landed, he had this Colonel Alf Pure arrested and murdered. You know, Colonel Alf Pure was not a good guy. And this, the Church of Scientology, it had a different corporate name. They didn't want to know as a Scientologist, were in bed with Colonel Alf Pure. That's not, they did not want to kill the king. But they became a pariah when everything was discovered and they had to get the hell out of Morocco. And it was a it was very exciting times. I was very new to the organization at this point. And as coincidence would have it, and I was telling Greg, uh, we have a planetary healing group that meets once a month in Oceanside, and, and the girl where this her house is held, she happens to have a roommate who was Colonel Alf Pierre's secretary. She was a re I said, oh, I was in Morocco. She's Moroccan. And she says, oh, I was arrested. I remember that. I remember the Scientologists. So she's become a friend of mine and has invited me over to Morocco, which I'd love to go. Uh, I just don't know how I would swing it. But so but as I went to Morocco, and the only places I ever went in Morocco were Casablanca and Tangier, which is to the north across the Straits of Gibraltar. And I always thought, why am I going to Morocco? What's the significance here? And there was, I only went off on you know a Liberty Day, which you would take only one day in Tangier. I went to a place called Robinson's Beach off Tangier, and as we're going to find some waves to body surf, and as on the way there, it's about 40 minutes outside of town. You're taking a taxi, and as the taxi would wheel its way on this road, you'd see these people walking with all their worldly possessions. And I said, who are these people? They're not the Arabs. Their skin was white. They were Caucasian. I said, who are these people? One lady reminded me of the Virgin Mary. She was on a donkey, you know. They were kind of a cute people. But I said, who the hell are they? I've never heard of these people. And they would later play into my synchronicities in this, this new book I just released, The Matzah of the Living. They were the Berber people. And Although my name is Peter Moon, and you know me as Peter Moon, it's a, it's a pen name I've adopted and I use. My real name, which was my given name, was Vince uh, Barbaric, which came from Berberish, which I, my parents never knew this or told me this, but it was comes from the Berber people. So, as I would learn, I, I might have more African heritage than a lot of black people who aren't even from Africa. They might be from America, you see? So, it, it, gave me an it, and I, but I wouldn't find this out for years because my mother was Celtic where my father was from Croatia and Italy so my mother had another connection because the Celtic people come from or pass by way of Northern Africa because they have the same uh, I guess what you say genetic characteristics and they all come from a all of these Moorish Berber people have a come from a blue race. We'll get to that later. Um, so anyway, I was spending time, I had a, this experience in Scientology, which had led me right to Morocco, which was just kind of a stopping post for a few uh, months of my life. And when, when we left Mor uh, Morocco, and when we left Morocco, it was very exciting. It was like the CIA was uh, spreading all sorts of rumors and we're trying to get Scientology out of Morocco because they didn't want Scientology to have, they hated Scientology. And 
the U.S. government was always gunning for you. And then we had, um, the Mossad was very active in Moroccan politics. Morocco was a big ally of the Mossad, the Jewish intelligence force. And the Mossad and the CIA had trained Colonel Alfker, who was doing all this miserable stuff to the king, um, who was able to live as a long time for the king of Morocco. Now, So I, I, I guess I was in Scientology for uh, about 12 years, and in 1983, I left because the organization had been taken over by the government in a very systematic way I've delineated in my book, Montauk Book of the Dead. And the Montauk Book of the Dead is a very interesting, it's kind of my life story, because I've written all these books but I wrote the Montauk Book of the Dead because it, it didn't mean, I didn't mean it to come out this way. And I will now go explain into the, the genesis of, of the, let's see, these two books were supposed to be one book. But if they were one book, this is kind of a thick book, you know. It's not good economically to produce it. Maybe it worked for you. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it, it just, it would have taken me. I, it took me, like, I think, 12 years to write this book, okay? This one took about a year. But the reason it became two books, and I will go back into this whole Scientology experience. When I was, I mentioned that I had left my body. And then when I got involved, and I never forgot that experience, and of course there were many subsequent experiences, but I, before I left Scientology, what I realized if you spend so much time out of your body, you're not going to be here. You might forget to get uh, change the oil to your car. You might have a mishap. You might uh, not. You might forget to brush your teeth and have teeth problems. I mean, if you're focusing not on the here and now. And because I'm a Capricorn, I'm, I said I want to focus on the here and now. I want to pay attention to physical reality. And I I left the Church of Scientology to go be a part of society. Because there's a tarot card called the world. And you can be cloistered in a religious environment. And there's a, there's a book by Herman Hess called Magister Ludi or the Glass Bee Game, which kind of gives the same syndrome. If you're in a secluded, cloistered, um, esoteric atmosphere, at some point you have to go out and face the world. Otherwise, you're just going to be uh, a cloistered, you know, monk, nun, priest, you know what they get. You're not functional in the world. So I said, I remember that tarot card, even though I didn't study the tarot, I said, it's, it's time to go. And I left, got involved in the Montauk Project, and then there was something very, very funny that happened as I began to study the Montauk Project and the Philadelphia Experiment. There were a couple of movies that came out about the Philadelphia Experiment movie. And I was having dreams of an area in Southern California um, where my parents lived in Ventura. And I began to have dreams of the highway, and they were exotic dreams. Now the highway, it's just a highway, it's a pretty part. But my dreams were exaggerating the beauty. So I kept having these dreams, and I thought it was connected to one of these movies in the Philadelphia Experiment, the Synchronicity, because it was taken in a town near there. So I attributed it to some weird synchronicity, but I began having the dreams. And I kept having the dreams until finally, I went by that area in the physical universe on a, on a vacation. And as I drove by, I was, I'm mistelling the story. This telling story, I have, to, I have to digress or reinvent my story. I'm going to go back to this point. It's not going to have as much meaning. In the pursuit of these synchronicities, I discovered in a book called The History of Long Island, which became my book, The Pyramids of Montauk. And I'm going to pass around this book. It also appears in the Montauk Pyramids of Montauk. I discovered a book by Rufus Wilson. The name Wilson was appearing again. 
I opened the book and I saw this thing. It says, The Pyramids, Montauk. Okay, I'm discovering the, this, there, there were pyramids in Montauk. I'm going to pass this around so you can all look at the pyramid. And so why are there pyramids in Montauk? There was no explanation in the book why there were pyramids in Montauk. Now, I've just been discover, uh, writing about a time travel research project there. So I asked the librarian, and she took me to a room in the back, a research room, and I, she allowed me to look in books that were not open to the public, and she said, it said that the, the Montauk Air Force, where the Montauk Air Force Station is, known as Camp Hero, was once sacred Native American ground. And it, the family that ruled the Montauks were known as the pharaohs. These are like the pharaohs of Egypt. And I said, pharaohs and pyramids and Montauk, this is bizarre. So I had to write a whole book to explain what were these, what were these pyramids doing here? What were these, um, why was the people named pharaohs? Now the, the history books, which were written by white people, said that there were 13 tribes on Long Island and that the royal family were the pharaohs and they lived at Montauk. So Montauk was a royal spot. And I would later learn that Montauk meant the highest of the high, the highest expression of the divinity in their language. And I began to, I had some contact with the Montauk Indians, and the matriarch of the Montauk Indians was a, a woman named Olive Farrell. Now Olive Farrell was a very nice lady. She had no knowledge of, of the Montauk project or even the pyramids, but I had written the book and after I wrote the book, she says, I want you to mention my son in the second printing, because you didn't mention him. I said, well, I didn't know you had a son. So I mentioned the book, and I sent it to her. And when she got the book, I called her up on the phone to see if she got the book. And she says, she didn't answer. Her sister answered and says, Olive just went to the uh, hospital with a bleeding gallbladder. Olive would never live. She would be in the hospital for a few weeks and die. So then I went to, uh, I went back to my research, and I said, "Oh my God!" And I and I was I was studying these synchronicities I had with the olive, which I will go into in a little more depth. And it said the olive would uh, would be used in the future to heal the gallbladder. She just died of one. But I had already been on a trail of olives, and I said, "Oh my God, her name's Olive, and she's sacred." Pharaohs. But I was put on to the olive by a mysterious friend of mine who showed up at a lecture he was giving one day and he brought me this picture. He brought me a uh, playbill from 1909 of the, it was called the New Montauk Theater. It was just an ordinary playbill from a long time ago. And I said, why are you giving me this? He says, it's for you. I just saw it and I, I knew it would be, I knew it was meant for you. And it's, I'm going to show you a picture over here. This is the Follies of 1909, the Montauk Theater. And I looked at this thing. because I was very much pursuing occult clues, I couldn't find any clues in it. I studied it for a while, gave it up, and after about a year, I had a man at my house from England, and we were talking about things, and I suddenly, and I had Duncan Cameron in my house, he was the psychic in the Montauk Project, I suddenly remembered this, this playbill, and I said, well, maybe Duncan could give me a psychic read on it, because he's a Cameron, and so I, I went down and I, up to my, I'd been sitting on the bottom of papers on my desk upstairs, so I brought it downstairs and I said, Duncan, here, let me give this to you. And as I gave it to him, the back of the cardboard in the back began to fall off, and I said, there's something underneath. And I, I pulled it open, and there was a picture of Christ on Mount Olive. And I said, oh my God, what is this? Why is this appearing right here? And Christ on Mount Olive. And it told me that I needed to study what is the Mount of Olives. So I called up my friend who gave it to me, and I said, what is this about? He says, well, you would have discovered this sooner or later. He says that the olives are sacred to the Knights Templar. And the Knights Templar revere the feminine energy. 
So I begin, he says, but see what an olive tree looks like. So I went on a quest to find an olive tree, which I'd never seen in person. And it took me a few months to find one in a, in a library book, because we didn't have the internet in those days. So he basically said an olive tree was a connection to the inner earth. They live 800 years. But then I began to study the olive and find out that the olive was sacred to uh, it was sacred to the Christians. They use it for chrism. It was sacred to Muslims, and it was sacred to Jews who used the oil to light the menorah for eight days in the temple. And it was also sacred to the Greeks. The Greeks had um, a contest to see who could give the greatest gift to mankind. And the winner was Athena. She gave mankind the olive. And the loser was Poseidon, who gave mankind the horse, which is the symbol on the Montauk Project, which is a male patriarchal symbol. They revered Athena. So she gave mankind the olive or the olive tree. They had one on Mount Olympus. Athens was named after Athena. And I, I was very um, much into this pursuit of olives. There are many synchronicities I had with olives. It's sacred. And then, I discovered through a friend of mine, Mark Roberts, that when he, he had studied my work, and he says, well, this olive, he says, he, he sent me some materials from a dowser called Egerton Sykes, who, who used to write journals on Atlantis. And his work showed that Athena was a name derived from an earlier African queen named Antonia. This is Antonia, whose name was transliterated into Athena. And Athena, Antonia, was a blue goddess from Atlantis. And her people migrated at the end of Atlantis. There was, I guess, priestesses. There were scribes. And the scribes went to Ireland, became the, the uh, Tawata Danan. That's sort of where my mother's family kind of descends from. And the, the temple priestess and the warriors went away. Some say they went and became the Vikings. And because there was no temple to guard anymore when Atlantis fell. And the priestesses migrated into Africa, into the, what is now the Sahara. It was a, a Triton Sea. It was a beautiful sort of garden of Eden. And they had a blue queen, okay, a blue queen. And one of my Moorish friends told me the olives symbolize all colors. Because olives come in all colors. They don't come in just black or green. And he said that olive was symbol symbolic of all races. And of course, this blue race, which I also wrote in The Black Sun, is indicative of what's called an RH negative blood type. The blue people, and this book goes into it in quite a bit of detail, how they legendarily descend from Mars. The word Cairo comes from Alcahira, which means Mars. And this book also explains how, see there's this occult, as I, I mentioned occult synchronicities, and there is a, an infamous occultist named Alistair Crowley who was featuring a lot of these things, and he channeled a book. He channeled a book uh, called The Book of the Law, which he channeled after going into the, the pyramid at Cairo a lot of strange circumstances around it, but, but the information he channeled in that book was decoded by a friend of mine who's an occultist, where it shows the interrelationship of five and six, okay? But you have to be able to read the code. There's whole secret societies based upon this magician that don't know what they're talking about. They're going off and spinning dark magic and doing irresponsible things and giggling about it, but they didn't know this code. That this, gentlemen I happen to know uh, decoded. And it's all about codes of five and six. And this ties into Cairo because what he said is it shows the pentagram, which is a five, and that hexagram, which is a six. And when you juxtapose them one on top of the other, it's like a male and a female going together. But it also is the, the structure for the Kabbalistic tree of life, which you've probably all seen. Now when you twist this, it becomes a DNA spiral. It's explained exactly in the book. It's, it's, it's 
So in other words, this channeled information through Alistair Crowley, who was a very, what you call, double agent, double sided character himself, he was channeling the structure of DNA, if you were so gifted as to be able to interpret, which he never did interpret. I didn't interpret it. I had a friend who had a, who had a gift for this, um, who had very strange experiences in his own right. But anyway, the five six is key when we consider Cairo because I found on another website where it explains the, what's called the one fifty six ratio, where the capstone of the Great Pyramid is one fifty six the size of the Great Pyramid itself. The capstone is one fifty six size. The capstone is missing. It represents the missing key to consciousness on this planet. Five, I said it's 156 the size of the Great Pyramid, the capstone. 150, in other words, if you took this, this area of the capstone, it would be 156 the size of the Great Pyramid itself. The Giza, the pyramid, the Great Pyramid is 156 size of the Giza Plateau, which is in turn 156 size of the continent of Africa, which is in turn one. 56 the size of the planet Earth. So you see, whoever built this pyramid knew this 5-6 ratio, which was symbolic of this DNA spiral. In other words, they knew they were life. This is a manifestation of a divine inspiration, a divine consciousness that was uh, manifesting itself through this dark magician who was bisexual and a lot more he called himself the Antichrist, so he was a very dubious character in himself. But he was in the Great Pyramid and spent the night in there with his wife uh, prior to having these revelations come, which actually came through his wife at first. She, she, they came through her initially, and she was not a medium or anything like that, but she kind of got in the mood of the pyramid. So the, if this was, what is, this is really saying is that whoever built that great, that great pyramid it's like a memory storage. And Egypt, of course, I would find out was called the land of the olives. Isis was the queen of the olives. Isis is also portrayed as blue. So it's not really a stretch when you look at all the data to think that it might have been off the planet uh, fertilization from a colony because according to tradition, Mars had to come here when they began to have their own problems on that planet. And of course, the RH negative, RH means rhesus factor, monkey blood. So most people in the world have RH positive. Most of us have a, a kinship with the monkeys. I don't even know what my blood type is, so it doesn't matter. If, if you're RH negative, you don't have that factor. Means and of course all the races are can have RH negative. It can be black, yellow, red, blue, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Um, and of course, I first kind of got interested in this when I had a, a friend who was black, and he told me that you know he'd been over to West Africa where he had a uncle or something, and he said the people would turn purple. They get so much sun they would actually turn purple, and the, the, when the sun would come out. So you have black people being purple or blue. You have white people, the Celtic people believe they were blue. Tibetans have blue gods. It's, it's a, a priori uh, function or, or manifestation. And it goes very deep. It goes very deep because it's embedded in our, in our culture in many respects. Um, the Queen Antonia um, who we consider Athena, the most sacred building in Athens was the Parthenon. Anybody who hasn't read the book know what Parthenon means. It's a word we've all heard though, but we don't know what it means. It starts from Parthogenesis, which is virgin birth. Athena was a virgin queen. She actually had a virgin birth in mythology. She came out of the head of her father, which was Zeus. He had a headache, and she just, you know, because she was Minerva, also in Rome, the 
wisdom. She had wisdom, so she came out of the head, which symbolizes a brain operating in full capacity. This virgin goddess. Now, Antonia was a virgin goddess. And because Egypt was settled from the west and she was there, she. Uh, there's also traditions linking why did Mary wear blue all the time? She's always positioned in blue. Mary, Mary the Virgin Mother. Now, it's very interesting that we associate Mars with Rome because Rome was founded by Romulus and Remus. But Romulus and Remus, and Remus is interesting too because Remus was the loser in the fight. Romulus killed his brother. <coughs> Remus represented the, the Romulus was patriarchal, Remus was matriarchal. And of course, Remus was later attributed to Uncle Remus, you know. And it, and it was kind of like a subtle put down. Yeah, that's deep right there, that's heavy. It's very deep. Yeah. But it wasn't necessarily purposeful, it wasn't necessarily accidental. And I learned that many of the slave names they gave to people were Roman, they called Venus. They called, you know, I mean, they, they yeah. give them Roman names. I, I don't quite understand why they did that. But I, I never put that connection with um, Uncle Remus, Uncle Remus, and Romulus and Remus. That's that's interesting. Exactly. Yeah. It's very it's very deep. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, remind me to do the Amos and Andy thing too to talk about how that is, is that. So, anyway, um, Re Romulus and Remus were the product of they were raised by a she wolf because they were left on the banks of the river. But their, their father was the god Mars, according to mythology. Mars, and they were coming from Mars. And the mother was, um, what was her name? Rhea Silvea. Rhea Silvea, which is kind of like Rhesus. You know, Rhea. Was, and Rhea Silvea was the, the Vestal Virgin. She was the first of the Vestal Virgins. So they had their own sacred temple. Just, they had their own well of souls, just like the Hebrews did. But theirs was underneath the form. So, this virgin theme is in Rome, it's in Greek, it's in Christianity, which comes much later. And I haven't heard of it in Egypt, but it would come through Antony, it might exist in Egypt, I'm not. You don't, if it, I, You already mentioned. I mentioned Isis, Isis but do they call Isis it Isis is, is Mari, which is Aset which is also born of the Persian birth, and who actually gives birth to the Persian birth, which is the foundation of the Black Madonna. Okay, the city of Paris, Paras, the house of Isis. So the city of Paris in France was founded on the cult of the worship of the Black Madonna, Asset. Okay, I didn't get that connection, that's good, because I, I had Paris, I went into Paris uh, you know, from, from Troy, which is also a, but that's very interesting. I appreciate that. Um, so there's a lot of tradition of virgin births. But what's as I began to well study this, I began to correlate something from one of my earlier books, Montauk Revisited, where um, I was introduced to the concept of a virgin birth. And it's a very interesting story how I even got into it, but I'm going to skip that for brevity today and say uh, but what I was told by a, a, a very good friend of mine who is a very knowledgeable person about occult matters, she says that a virgin birth occurs um, when the zona pellucida, which is the female egg, is penetrated by a late male protein in the, the, the body of the female. And the female, uh, of course, all females have proteins from their father. And when this would penetrate the egg, it would fool the egg into thinking it's a sperm, and it would manifest a child. Now, there was a lot of what you call mumbo-jumbo occultism and procedures that would go with this, but when the, when the birth did not work out properly, and often because you had dark people practicing it, you would have an attenuated virgin birth, which would result in an extra set of nipples. Okay? And you've probably heard of this. They call them, uh, in vulgar expression, witches' tits. And it's not uncommon that for somebody to have this, but it's an attenuated baby. And of course, if this were to work out magnificently, it would theoretically be a Christ. 
but more often it might be something of a mockery of a, of a Christ, like an antichrist or a golem or something like that. Um, so this is a magical doctrine, an occult doctrine, you know, which is better left for people like Rosemary's Baby. It's not a, a thing that healthy people normally practice because it's too arcane, too occult, and people don't even know what it is. If, if you're going to take, uh, in mythology, if we include Christianity as mythology, we'd say the most magnificent example in mythology is the Christ. You know, it's a magnificent example. You could say Horace too, but I'm not that schooled in kinetic knowledge to even be making such statements. But um, we could also say, what's the difference? But um, more to the point is, there was this doctrine of a virgin birth, and that I'd been sitting on for over 10 years, and I really couldn't take it any further until I started studying this stuff about Antonia, and I real and I I came across uh, through a friend of mine who's a tantra teacher, and she explained something to me that most people in our culture do not know about, and it's a very interesting thing in the feminine tradition. It's the Taoists and the tantras or the tantrikas call it moonflower, and moonflower is is now recognized in science. It was not recognized until about the 1980s. It's, it's what's called female ejaculatory liquid. And female ejaculatory liquid is an excretion like an ejaculation. It's not a lubrication, it's not a, it's not a ovum, it's a literal squirt. And in studying it, I found out that it's in pornographic videos where it's called the squirt. It's portrayed very vulgarly, yet it's just for sensationalism. It's really a sacred, uh, you know, part of the female experience. And there was a book in the 1980s, I think it was called The Sensuous Woman, where it brought this into the consciousness. But up until the 1980s, it was denied by science that it even existed. The women can't do that. They can't do it. It doesn't exist. Um, the British Film Board said, is to this day, says that it doesn't exist. Um, it's urine. And of course, what does the British Film Board have any business saying anyway? What did you say, Peter? Was urine? Yeah, they say it's urine. Oh. <laughs> it's the British Film Board. I mean, where do they get this? You know, I mean, this is you know, an insane sort of thing. Now, 6% of women, statistically, it said, if you look it up on Wikipedia, uh, female ejaculation, You'll see six percent of women do it. Another fourteen percent, they do it regularly. Fourteen percent of women do it willy-nilly here and there, and the rest of the women don't. Okay, it's a lost art of the feminine. Okay, and it has to do with repression of women, and what we'd say. Even though when the Constitution was written, and it said that slaves had three fifths of a vote. They didn't really quite have three, three but they, they at least said they, women didn't have any vote. So that shows that rhetorically, women were thought of less than a slave in terms of voting. In social habits, I don't know if they were, but in terms of who they really are, they probably, on some level, were worse than a slave, on some level, in terms of their, who, their inner spiritual being. So this is the repression that we're suffering from. And of course, my friend Marjorie Cameron. That was part of her mission. Welcome, John. Uh, so, could all cell phones be going vibrate? Just a second. We don't have cell phones, we won't feel like we're in modern culture. <laughs> you know, they, well, they can vibrate. Oh, go ahead. Do you want to say something? Yes. Why weren't women allowed to vote? Why weren't they? Well, we're going to take questions at the end. Uh, hold on a second. We're going to take questions at the end. Yeah, this, okay, but what did so, you say? The Constitution of what? The United States. The United States did not, uh, the Constitution did not give women a vote. I, I can't answer for that. I didn't write it. Uh, yeah, but let's, uh, let's, hold, up, um, we'll let's hold off onto the questions until uh, 2.30. Yeah, okay. So, what I was going to say was that what I, I wanted to study the chemical constituents of this stuff. And it, it gets pretty detailed and complicated, but what I found out is this female ejaculatory liquid is essentially the same thing as male sperm. 
it's not really any different. Wow. And this gives us, this not only tells us that it's, of course it's a lost art, and it also says that the chemical constituency of it changes to based upon diet, menstruation, other circumstances. So there would have been a whole procedure and ritual to make this work to where a woman could have her own baby, possibly even conceived by herself. Okay? And, and this is a scientific plausibility that's more than a plausibility because it's just missing. People don't know how to do it anymore, except for some strange old occultist, which there is a, this whole secret society is based upon doing it, but they really don't know what they're doing. They're, they're lost. So this is a lost art, but see, this answers so many questions of people will argue about the virgin birth. Well, could, could he, it's not even a miracle. It's an amazing thing by our standards of today, but it, it's, it's a natural, so you could say, if we want to adopt the mythology or the religion of Christianity, we could say that that was people that really knew what they were doing. We could say that if we wanted to. It wasn't a miracle in the sense that we normally think of it as a miracle. And this kind of like takes a lot of balloon out of a lot of the untruth that's out there. Now, Queen Antonia was the, the one who gave the olive tree to Africa and it eventually migrated to Greece. And she was the purveyor of the olive. Now, what I want to get back to is, I want to go back, fast forward to what I was saying when I was having this dream of these miraculous palm trees and landscapes in Southern California, which were exaggerated. As I went by that area where my parents were buried, I saw a sign that said, Los Adobe Los Olivos, which means House of the Olives. I said, why does the turnoff have an olive house next to my parents? When I got home that night, I told, told my sister, and she says, that's where mom and dad are buried. They're buried on the old branch of the olives. I said, wow, that's heavy. You know, my parents died uh, in 1974, and now they're buried on the land of the olives. Then I, I, uh, went, I began to have dreams of Davis, where I first, I said, why am I having dreams of David, Davis, where I, I got into Scientology? And then I realized that where I first left my body, was on a place called Olive Drive. I go, oh my goodness, Olive Drive, my parents are buried on the olives, and I was able to handle the death of my parents very well because of what I learned in Scientology. So I ended up having to write this whole book to explain the whole Scientology part of my life, you know, the, and, and how it tied in. And But the, the book about the olives and, and the Moor, Moorish connection is right here which was the book I really wanted to write. But this kind of got in the way, so I had to go into this whole, this olive thing had kind of come from outside, but it was the olives in part that drove me to the Moors, to my ancient, and I, I, I saw that my mother's family line, by namesake, I can't show the actual lineage, traces down to the Berber people, and then my father, through the namesake, travels down through the Berber people. And as I say, this woman, who was the secretary of Colonel Alper, she says, you are a Berber, I can see it in you, you have the, features of the Berber. So it's, um, and of course my father had a great kinship to the Moors, which he never quite explained. Uh, just that he really respected them and liked them and used to put my face in it every now and then when I, you know, because he, he was a student of history. Of course, he didn't know the Moors as, as many of us know them today. He knew them as the standard diatribe you read about, but he said they were the, the bringers of knowledge to, you know, astronomy, algebra, and whatnot. He had a great respect for them, and evidently had the, the Moorish blood himself. Um, the, now there's also, I want to touch on the, the Amos and Amy thing. As, now there's something else that's very interesting. There was a, uh, a space-time project called Ong's Hat that came in New Jersey, southern New Jersey, which is known as the land of the Jersey Moors. And Ong's Hat is an obscure location in the Pine Barrens of New Jersey where there was a experimentation of dissident physicists from Princeton, hippies, Sufis, that claimed to be operating on, uh, with somebody from the Moorish Science Temple. Now this is, Ong's Hat is part legend and part truth, but the Moorish Science Temple, I'd never heard of before. But what I did know 
was there was a character named Peter Lamborn Wilson, there's the name Wilson coming up again, who had, who was a member of the Moorish Orthodox Church. And the Moorish Orthodox Church was tied to Timothy Leary and the Millbrook Institute up in uh, upstate New York. And they were kind of a CIA affiliated church that was mocking Moorish wisdom. I say mocking. They had a certain amount of tribute to it. But I thought that this was all there was. I didn't know there was a Moorish Science Temple until I wrote this book, Synchronicity of the Seventh Seal, where I was contacted by some Moors who began to fill me in on the Moorish legacy that it was still alive, that there was a Moorish Science Temple. These people weren't part of it. They didn't like the Moorish Science Temple. They, they thought that it had become institutionalized. They were, op they were Moors and they were operating outside of it. But I wrote The Seventh Seal because as I began to get a lot of, um, as I'm writing this information, you might say a lot of negative spirits would come to me that didn't want me to do it. Sometimes it would come in the form of media people who were ready to uh, insult me behind my back, not on the air, but stop me from getting media appearances and whatnot. And I had to write this book to extricate myself. It was like an exorcism. And what came out of it was a very strong recognition and identification with the Moors, even though I didn't know there were Moors to any significant extent, other than the Moorish Orthodox Church. And what I discovered, of course, I wrote this book and, and they they contacted me. And I, you know, I, I was flown to Chicago and spoke to some Moors there. It was very wonderful. And in DC, and one of my friends who's now passed away, Elias Bay, he said this book was his Bible. He carried around his Bible. He liked it so much. And he because it was recognizing the Moors, but I was coming through it through my research in synchronicity. And one of the uh, interesting things I found out was April Fool's Day was, okay, March 31st, 1492, the Jews were expelled from Spain. And this is just, you know, six months before Columbus goes to America. And April 1st, they, didn't, they don't talk about it, but what happened on April 1st, according to tradition in Spain, is that they told all the Moors, they said, you can, uh, we've kicked out the Jews, and you're friends of the Jews, you can go, you can go. We've got ships waiting for you, you can go back to Morocco. You, you know, you've lost the war in Spain, but we'll let you go. And so they said, we don't believe you. Well, they, so they saw there were ships waiting for them, so they left. And while they left, in between going to their ships, they burned their houses and burned the ships. So they were homeless. This was on April 1st, 1492. This becomes April Fool's Day. Ha, ha, ha. You've been fooled. This is a denigration of the Moors, which is by the Catholic Church. And there was the siege of Granada, where they, had the, they built the town of Santa Fe. They, Isabella burned down their, their, their little huts, they, they, were, they were just doing a stakeout on Granada because Granada was landlocked, or so to speak, in the mountain. They just waited to starve them out. And they built a little town, burned down, so they built a new town made of uh, stones and had a cross, you know, and it was called Santa Fe. And there, there was the capitulation of Santa Fe where a treaty was signed. And I, I haven't seen this treaty, but apparently I'm told it was a, a capitulation. It was not the Moors allowed. This is I can't prove this, but according to my friend Elias Fay, they allowed the Catholic Church or the Spanish government. And when I first heard of Noble Drew Ali in connection with this experiment at Ong's Hat, I said, "This guy sounds like a mythological character." He was. Um, he had a father who was a slave. He was from North Carolina. His mother died young, as did his father. When he was young, he lived with an aunt who would beat him. He had paranormal abilities. At a young age, he supposedly became a merchant seaman or stowed away and went to Egypt. When he went to Egypt, he ended up amongst a group of masters recognized. They saw him. We've been waiting for you. 
so they, they initiated him into the Great Pyramid. They took him into the pyramid blindfolded and say, work your way out. Not necessarily expecting the aspirin to live. And when they found him, they found him. He got out of almost immediately. They, they were surprised and they found him between the paws of the Sphinx. And the paws of the Sphinx are very symbolic. You know, it's the cradle of knowledge. In many ways I can tell you which we won't go into. But Noble Drew Ali um, was sent on a mission back to America, where he was from, to teach the Moorish people their true heritage. And he taught that that there were Moors in America before there were what we know as Native American Indians, and that this history has been obscured and robbed. And it's not only robbed the so-called black people, it's robbed the white people. It's robbed everybody, because the knowledge is what's lost, you know. And it, it's, it's almost, you have humanity enslaving its best, you know, taking the best part of itself and, and cutting it off. Which is, if you look at human beings in general, you know, <coughs> you know, if, if the roles were reversed, they might have done the same thing. You know what I'm saying? It's just like human, the human condition is such that let's choke off the knowledge. But anyway, that's what happened. And Noble Drew Ali lived the 1900s and the 20s, and he became very popular. He was very charismatic, very gifted. And uh, Elihu Pleasant Bay wrote this book, Noble Drew Ali, spent a great deal of his life. He, he knew one of Noble Drew Ali's uh, wives, because he had more than one wife. And he was very popular in the 20s. And he was so popular, he became quite a problem to the, the government, because he was lifting the black communities up, and in a way that they weren't used to being lifted up. He wasn't using Christianity. He was using uh, his own brand of Islam. And of course, I was shocking to me as I began to actually read the history, find out that he had a whole FBI file. They were bird dogging him. And then, um, out of the, when, when, there was a lot of power surrounding him. He went into a police, the police took him in, they arrested him, they let him go, but he died mysteriously. Now some people say it was from the police, that he had a police beating, which Elihu Pleasant Bay says that was not true, he just died. And he said the reason that he died was because the burden on the Moorish people was too great. He could do more from outside of the body than inside the body. Insight that he was one of the people influencing my synchronicities from the outside. That was quite a moment, you know, an aha moment. Um, and he has a grave, I believe, in Chicago. I'm not real sure about that, if it's still there or not. But he, was, he, he lived in Chicago at that point. He was from Newark um, in earlier North Carolina. But, but the interesting thing about Noble Drew Lee is that as I begin to um, study him, he, the whole TV show, first it was a radio show of Amos and Andy, was designed to lampoon Noble Drew Ali and the Morris Science Company. Because I don't know how many of you have seen Amos and Andy. I saw it as a kid in the 50s wasn't really interested in it, didn't like it because the character was always having a hard time. He was always in the butt end of the joke. I didn't think it was too nice. But what he was is, is that the main character was Kingfish. But it was funny as hell though. <laughs> it was. It was a funny well, show. Yeah, well, I was too young to, to get the funny stuff. Yeah. I, didn't, I, didn't I started know. watching later on as time. Oh, it would be hilarious now. Yeah. But I didn't get it. I mean, I was young. I'm just watching this getting the ass into them. Yeah. So I'm the kid. I don't understand the the stereotyping humor. I don't understand anything. Uh, it was said in the 20s that the black people loved it just as much as the white people. Okay. It was just funny. It was funny. But it was he was the kingfish, and he had his order of the Mystic Knights of the Sea. 
Now that's the Moors. The Moors are the best. Sailors. That was in, in the show. Yeah, the Order of the Mystic Knights of the Sea. He belonged to the Order of the Mystic Knights of the Sea, and they had like, you know, the head jellyfish and the head mackerel, and uh, the congregation were called sardines. <laughs> this is really funny. <laughs> But they were lampooning the real Moorish Science Temple, which Drew Ali had set up. And they had one episode where they had Ali Bendo, this crystal gazer who was arrested. You see? It was like they were mocking the Moorish Science Temple. Now, the, what's interesting is, is about why, I said, who was sponsoring this? It turned out to be, it was Pepsi. And I, I found out a whole, I studied the whole history of Pepsodent and the guy, it was very, I, I put it in the book, it's, it's bizarre, all the connections with Pepsodent and why it relates to teeth and whatnot. But the, Amos and Andy was the first syndicated show in the history of broadcasting. It got syndicated was football. You know, Red Grange and all that, those days in the 20s. Not even baseball had been syndicated at that point. It was Amos and Andy, and this was it was a Masonic duo that had done this. They worked for they were Freemasons, high-level Freemasons, and they created this very funny show, which was so nobody could possibly take Moorish science seriously, and black people in general would be lampooned. And if you even watch the Hollywood movies of those era, and the way black people were portrayed, even beyond the Stephen Fetchett. They are, it is just, nobody would do that now, unless they were just making fun of making fun of it, you know, Eddie Murphy or somebody. But it, it's like, you know, it, it was in such a way that white people could not take a black person seriously. And having grown up in a, in a community where you were told that, my mother said, that, no, they don't, I said, why don't black people live here? It's just that they, they, they steer them away. In other words, they, they steer, it was called steering. And it was just, you know, she explained it to me. Uh, and the attitudes of the people were such that, no, they, they weren't to be taken seriously. They, they, it was something you didn't talk about too much. But, it, you know, so, you know, when you make fun of something, and, it, and they were making fun of Drew. Now, what's interesting about Noble Drew Lee is that most people don't know that out of his death arose a man called Wally Fard. And Wally Fard has an FBI file and a very obscure lineage. Like, he seems to come from Hawaii. He might have some Polynesian blood in him. He seems to have some white blood in him. He doesn't seem to have any black blood in him. He might, but he doesn't seem to. Yet he becomes the head of this Moorish Science Temple. And then he picks Elijah Muhammad to be the head of the new reorganization, which is the church, what do they call it, the Church of Israel. The nation of Islam. Not a church yet. Yeah. Nation of Islam. So you find as when you find out about the nation of Islam, they do know that they had Noble Drew Ali as their original founder, but they don't give him much airtime. Right. Exactly. And most of the people don't know this. You know, even people in the nation of Islam. The, the higher ups don't know. And of course White people don't know much about the nation of Islam anyway. They just look at it in an antagonistic oil on their side. Most people, not all. And of course, Barack Obama has to know about the Moors because he's from Chicago. And I'm told that even the white people in Chicago know about the Moors because they have a very strong presence in the parades. So there will be some, you know, knowledge of this. And you know, th th this this is what the Seven Seal is. I, I wrote in, and I'm just researching this stuff on my own. I'm not being prompted to do it because my knowledge, my path of synchronicity is leading sort of a tribute to the Moors as this ancient lost knowledge. And then when I wrote the book, I was contacted by Moors through Elias Bay. Um, and I, I went deeper into some threads in, in a book called The Stand Down Mystery, which is kind of a follow-up to The Black Sun, which is a tribute to Moorish culture but it's written in a novel form. Uh, for those of you who like The Black Sun or The Seven Seal, that's a follow-up to it. Um, so that, that is um, kind of my connections to the Moorish culture. Now, we're going till 3.30? 3.30. 3.30. Uh, you want to take question and answers at 3 o'clock? What or I want to do, do, you want to take a break? I, 
you know, we can take a break. We can do questions at the same time. I don't need a break, but I want to touch on this, this Transylvania book for about the last half hour because it's really interesting. It takes us off in a different direction. So if you want to get up and, and uh, drink or mosey, I'll just sit here and, and listen to questions. We All right, we'll be back and take a break, and we'll be back in about five minutes. Yeah, and you, you, in the meantime, you can ask questions if you want, and we'll... Well, okay, okay, well, you keep giving. Oh, you want to make sure um, to take a break? Let me just, uh, could you just elaborate just on a minute? When you talked about the um, RH factor dealing with animal blood and monkey blood. It was right. RH positive and RH mm -hmm. negative. One has monkey blood and one doesn't. Can you just, just a second to, for clarification? For me on that? Well, the RH factor is, it has to do with antigens. I don't know if I can give you the correct, correct explanation off the top of my head, but, but the, the Rh negative blood does not respond to antigens in the same way that Rh positive one. I haven't explained in the book. I mean, you can look it up pretty easy. It's just exactly how it, you know. Um, they haven't been able to find in Rh negative blood. They don't find this connection to the rhesus monkey. That's why it's called Rh negative. It has to do with. Uh, I, I wrote it out specifically in. In the book, you can, you which book was that? The, the book of the living. The book of the living. Because you know, I anticipated your question, but I put it in the writing rather than. I'm not a biologist. I don't always remember this stuff real well, but I, I cover my bases. Um, it's not unknown. But most doctors, at least when I wrote this, the first book on it, Black Sun, most doctors did not know that Rh negative meant rhesus negative. Just Rh negative. You know, they don't. They only study what they have to. And and what I do is I move into a realm of occult biology, even with the with the, the liquid moon flower I was talking about, where you get on the cutting edge of where biologists don't know what you're talking about because they're been trained to look at things a certain way. Yes. Yeah. Um, you demystified the uh, feminine ejaculation process, and um, the Moorish temple you're speaking of, they speak on a lot of these mysteries as my story. Would you also um, clarify lycanthropic? I ain't gonna bring that up though. Would you clarify lycanthropic mystery as my story? Lycanthropy is, is, is werewolf, you know. And of course, what, you know, this gets into occult biology and the ability of, of the body to do different things which is in more elevated spiritual states. And I, what, what, to answer you right now, what I'm kind of studying is the collapsing of the 23rd chromosome, which is known as the sex chromosome, which was theoretically a 24th and a 23rd chromosome, and they collapsed together. And this, when this collapse happened, we lost our ability to do many things. One of which would could theoretically ostensibly be shape shift. Twenty fourth is shifting, so when we collapse, you're saying we're not able to no more, or we just lost. It. Well, I guess people are reported to now. I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, through my travels, I met the, uh, the the medicine man of the Montauk Indians, Artie Crippen, and he. Um, I was with him in a bunch of his friends, Indian friends, and one of them said that they were in a car and they saw uh, a rabbit go across the highway, and when he got across, he turned into a man and walked away. And I said, did you see that? He goes, yeah. I said, did the other people in the car see it? He goes, yes, they did. I said, were they all natives? He said, yes. They're all natives. They weren't, you know, non-indigenous people. So it suggests, and, and one of my shaman friend says that the natives of the Montauk Indians see stuff all the time. They just don't talk about it because they don't want to be labeled crazy. You know, and some of you might have that experience too. Um, so, any other questions? While we're um, on this thread, I mentioned this Part of this, what I, as, I, as I make my travels, I meet Artie Crippen, the pharaoh of the Montauk Indians. And he was, 
this is in the Montauk Book of the Living. And what Artie was very interesting because at the age of about 12 or 13, he was on the Shinnecock Reservation. These men from the Lakota Reservation, these two medicine men came to see him. And they wanted to get at this young teenager. And he said, his family was protective of him. He said, well, we've been waiting 30,000 years for him. Our tribe's been waiting 30,000 30, years for him to incarnate. He's the second coming of the pharaohs. And his family thinks he's nuts. They think they're nuts. And a fight almost breaks out. Which didn't do any good because these guys were boxers. They were trained boxers and stuff like this. And, and they, but they held their own. And, and Artie's grandfather, who was a great football player, said, let him talk to him. And they told him, you're this, this heavy character. You know, We want to know you. We want you. So when he grew up, he went to the South Dakota to meet them and work with them. And he began five years of preparation for the Sunday. And according to him and according to them, because I met them, he's the only one that's really ever done the Sundays properly. Because it's very excruciating. You're going out there without any food or water, so that they'll, they, they'll let you eat oranges and they'll, they'll let you <coughs> subvert the process. But it takes five years of preparation to do it. You know, you're doing these piercings and whatnot. And when he did it, he went up in this mountain and he was given eagle feathers from the other side. When he came down the mountain with the eagle feathers, all the other medicine men who came over from all over the country were jealous. We've been doing this all our whole lives and we haven't gotten eagle feathers. Mm -hmm. Now you're getting them. Well, he's special. So Artie is a neat character, and, and I hope that actually, well, all the information I talk about is obviously interesting to you people, and it's interesting to me. I have something better for you. And I'm mean, not to put down my own stuff. Is Artie, he grew up, he was one quarter Shinnecock, one quarter Montauk. He has special medicine man ability. He, and we could have him come here, you know, that we could do this too. But as he grew up, Bruce Lee used to come to the Shinnecock Reservation, and he knew Bruce Lee as Uncle Lee, because Artie was always involved in the martial arts. But Artie introduced me to somebody who's far better than Bruce Lee, and that's his teacher, Roosevelt Ganey. So we, here we get back to the Tao, where Roosevelt is a Taoist priest. And he's of what he's part Cherokee Indian, but he's also of you know to call black skin color. He said he has so many relatives, he can't begin to say you know what he is and what he isn't. But um, Artie started me in a wellness program with his tribe, and he invited us after a month to go meet his teacher in Connecticut, who was the World Tai Chi Day, which he was in, in the one in Harlem this year. But he said, and I was the only one that went, and I got to meet his teacher. And after a year of finding out who his teacher was, he's like one of the most accomplished people. And he's learning, he learned, he was a, a martial artist, a champion, kickboxer, you know, karate and whatnot. And one time he saw this little oriental guy on the beach. He went down to spar with him, and this guy cleaned his clock. He said, nobody can clean my clock like that. So he became his student. And this teacher was C.C. Ling, and C.C. Ling, uh, taught him through motion. After five years, Roosevelt Ganey learned that his teacher actually spoke English. He never told him he spoke. He ordered him in a bar, he ordered a drink in English. Said, you speak English? And but he was teaching him six hours a day for six for twelve years actually. And he was teaching him a, a feminine technique that C.C. Ling had learned from his mother. Because his father used to beat him up. His father was Korean. And his mother was Chinese. And she taught him her son had to defend himself by using a feminine technique of Qigong, which is great for the health. It's not just martial, it's for the health, primarily. And this, and he, and these were secrets he taught him so that Chinese will not teach him. And so because he was prejudiced, people were prejudiced because he was a half Korean, he was half Korean and half Chinese, he taught his secrets to a black man to get even with the Chinese and the Koreans for hating him. So these secrets which you can learn are now in Brooklyn. Roosevelt teaches in Coney Island on the weekends, in the park outside. He teaches in Bed-Stuy on Monday, Tuesday, and Thursdays, and Wednesday morning at a church in DePaul in Brooklyn. And I've been studying with him for two years. And we can, uh, and I want you, uh, Greg said he'd have him here in, in uh, in September or something like this. This guy is the, the part two, the metaphysics part two. Pardon? Metaphysics 101. 
Uh, actually, 102. That's in the fall. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm saying is this guy, like, I couldn't throw a football more than 10 yards because I hurt myself. He gave me an exercise to do, which is someone that says, you yeah, do this, no problem. Sure enough, he was right. That was right after, I asked him that right after he showed me how to uh, touch my toes. I couldn't touch my toes. I said up to him, he says, there's nothing to do with it. He shows me a stretch. In five minutes, I can touch my toes. <laughs> and he teaches me how to run. Uh, he knows all functionality of the sports. It's not his specialty, but he, can, he knows every function of the human body. Uh, and he works on staff at the Brooklyn Hospital. It's his energy work. His system is the Taoist system of living arts. And I, I set out on this path to study the Tao when I was a teenager. It took me 37 years to find a teacher. But he's teaching me, teaching it to me in ways of health, in ways of, sure, you learn, learn how to protect yourself. But it's, this is the greatest gift I can give you is to, is we can have, you guys can come to class if you want. You can, uh, in Brooklyn, if you live nearby, it's easier. I come from Long Island. I, I go once a week. I was going all the time, but it, you know, I realized I could do more practicing on my own, you know, because you got to practice. Ideally, 10% of your day, two and a half hours a day. And it's just really a wonderful thing being you can get your athletic skills back. I've watched some of the old timers at Old Timers Day that are not old, old, and I said, they can't run to first base. <laughs> it's sad that if they had been doing some of these stretches, they were world-class athletes, and they don't have to do this. And you, in other words, you don't have, just because you're at a certain age doesn't mean you have to stop. In other words, if you've noticed steroids have pushed athletes into their 40s, at least in baseball, without steroids, they could be pushed infinitely. Infinite, especially if they have the skill. Um, so this is a great gift that you're all, and afterwards I'll be happy to answer any questions on that. Um, now, I'm going to, anybody have any more questions before we go on? Yes, Yes, uh, I wanted to ask you about Ron Hubbard, because I read his book, Dianetics, and mm -hmm. uh, I think I must have read it in the early 90s. And it, it resonated with me when I read the book. And I know it was like the late 90s when I made one of the meetings. Right. And I think I only made one meeting and I knew that I didn't want to be there. It's because it's all controlling and regulated. And, and it's, it's, it's all designed to control and regulate and extract from you. And, and when that book was written, it was free. We do it, it, it on each other. You know. And there was a big movement to do that in the 80s, and then it was shut, cut short because they wanted to take everybody's name and <laughs> regulate them, and it's like, enough, enough, nobody wants this. And, you know, they, they lose people by not doing what he said. But it's not only that, because when that happened, I think it was the late 90s, maybe 98, and I got that point, I was living in Queens, and since then I moved three times, right. and those people have tried to. Well, that's, see, that becomes like it. It becomes like an intel operation. You know? It's like who wants that? Who even wants to be around an organization that does that? It's like enough. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, it's money and it's control and it's manipulation. So it's like, yeah, you, you know, um, there, there, there was one of my friends calls my experience the Camelot of Scientology because you could go in and do certain things and you could do and. and uh, I can't answer for them or speak for them because I've had nothing to do with them for 27 years. So it's like, and I don't want anything to do with them. Uh, but, you know, that's just a part of my history and it was like, I was given a very brief moment in time where I could negotiate. That's kind of how I got here. Uh, and I'm glad I had the experience, but it took a 12 years out of my life and doing it at the highest level. I wasn't, you know, that's the one of the questions I wanted to ask. I don't know if you can answer it because you said you didn't benefit. I mean, is there anything you can share about what you have done? Well, I tell you, I, I told you I went out of my body, and not everybody has that experience. You see people that have been at 25, 30 years leaving very disaffected, saying, I never learned how to do this. You know? Well, I, I was, I would have been the last candidate to expect that I would have had that experience just by the way I was. But I have, 
because it, it had happened. I didn't want it. I didn't ask for it to happen. It happened. Maybe I was lucky. But did you achieve that mental clarity that you talked about? Yeah, That's a lot of mental clarity. But I'll tell you this about mental clarity. Uh, I got divorced eight years ago. It was very unpleasant. And it's, and let, let me say that my wife and I, who had a wonderful relationship at one point, didn't have a very good relationship. And but we still maintain contact because I still have to pay her and I have a daughter between us. And she was complaining to me about mental clarity. And you know, maybe some menopause kicking in, and I said, Well, why don't you start doing these Qigong exercises? and start rolling a ball on your foot every night before you go to bed for five minutes, one minute on, one minute off, and you'll sleep better. And she was complaining of mental clarity, so I, I showed her the Qigong, and it took me a year to get her to class, and she comes to class once a week with me. We go together, and it makes the relationship quite good, and she's learning. You know, she's like, oh, I've got mental clarity now. I want this, that, wow, wow, wow. So you get your mental clarity with doing Qigong. And you know, my teacher studied dynamics in the, in the 70s. He was also an ex, he was doing peer lectures to pyramids on scientists in the 70s. He was a natural healer before he learned this. He's very, got a lot of specialized knowledge himself, but you won't meet anyone who has more knowledge of the human anatomy. And she, and by the way, uh, you know, like, he can, I've routinely seen him, you know, stop people in their tracks and knock them from 30 paces. This is cheap going through his body. And he doesn't do it with anybody. He does it with his more advanced students. Because you, a, a normal person can't take the hit. It's a cheat hit. So, so he's got great talent. And you can see it visibly demonstrated. And I would recommend you go this direction if you want mental clarity. Um, there's a lot of therapies out there. Some of them work. Some of them don't work. And some of them work for particular people. We all have a different path. But let me go into. This is a, something very interesting, and it's on a different thread. This is a brand new book. It's out in a couple of weeks, Transylvanian Sunrise. And Transylvanian Sunrise, of course, it's an intriguing title because it has Transylvania. But it's not about vampires. You'll see there's a picture of a sphinx that's in Romania on the, on the cover. And the reason I call it Transylvanian Sunrise, the book was called Enemy Within. This is not my book. This is added to by me. I write the, the introduction and two epilogues to the book because I actually went to the Sphinx. But in 1999, a man came to one of our monthly meetings in, in Montauk. I mean, not at Montauk, about Montauk. And his name was David Anderson, Dr. David Anderson, and he was a time travel scientist. And he had a time travel research center on Long Island. And he wanted to come and check out myself and Preston Nichols, my co-author, uh, and he introduced himself, told me he had a time travel research center. I already had an idea who he was because he subscribed to my newsletter. And I didn't think he had a real time travel research center, but he actually did. He, in the Air Force, he was put on a project to figure out a space-time module, what you call a um, example, module, you know, like let's figure out this problem because satellites in outer space were drifting several meters every year because they don't stay stable. So they wanted him to figure out a system or help figure out a system using his advanced knowledge of mathematics and physics to stabilize these things. So he used, for us laymen to say, uh, used some of Einstein's theories and, and developed a, a way to warp space and time so as to maintain these satellites in their orbit. You're creating a self-contained field, okay? That it's maintaining them so that, you know, these things are expensive. They can't keep going down and shooting them up. So when he got out of the Air Force, he patented these mathematical formulas and developed the Time Travel Research Center. It was very advanced. The day after he came and saw us, he took me, he wanted to take me out to lunch took me out to lunch and showed me his the business card of George Bush, who he just met the day before, George W. Bush, while he was running for office. You know, in 1999, he, was, he, was, he met him at the FBI building. He says, yeah, look who I met yesterday. Of course, we'd all heard of Bush. He was running for office. And so David had a lot of mysterious contacts in government circles. 
he was not in the government per se, but he became my friend. He put up my first website, and uh, you know, would come to meetings now and then. He was more interested in listening than he was in lecturing. I have a, a DVD here of him uh, in his called Journeys into Time about talking about time travel in a scientific reference for the layman, which was designed to get investors into his research center. He had no trouble attracting investment money because he could actually parlay his knowledge of satellites into a self-contained field the size of a soccer ball that would slow or speed up time. Now, you can, if you can slow down a heart or an organ, it's good for transplants. So the medical field was very interested in it. And he, had, he could demonstrate this knowledge. So David had this exciting company called the Time Travel Research Center, a big website. He wanted to do a museum on time travel. And he was very interested in my work because I'd written about time travel in the Montauk Project, and he liked my writing. So one day, but he was still kind of mysterious, and he, he called me to his apartment one night. It was an apartment that nobody had really ever been to in Kings Park, and he says, I want to talk to you for two reasons. One, I want to plan this big time travel event. We're going to have phys physicists from all over the East Coast come, and I want to promote your work, which was very nice of him to do. Because I don't get a lot of publicity or promotion because I'm very controversial without talking about the more stuff I'm controversial. You know, any which way. Any, any, the Scientology is controversial because the Scientologists don't want to promote me because I, I you know, and the, the anti-Scientologists even less so. so you know, you know, so I was very appreciative of him because he has a very strong scientific <laughs> credentials, and he's open to my stuff. And he says, "I want to do this event," but he says also, he says, "I was given a call last night." He says, "I'm to report to Moscow." Once you're in the military, you're always in the military. They call you the service, and this was right after 9/11. It was in November after 9/11. He says. I have a, they say, bring your plane ticket and your passport. Don't bring anything else because you can't take it with you. Report to Moscow. So he says, I don't like the feeling of this. And I, I, they say I'm going to be gone two weeks. But if I don't come back in two weeks, would you please make a noise and make a fuss? And maybe they'll send me back. I said, sure. Then we got talking to Ch about China. And I, I told him about this Chinese Christmas card I once got from these publishers in China. He says, I have a Christmas card from China. He takes me over to his mantle. He's got a Christmas card from the president of China. He's got all these Christmas cards from world leaders. Like, you know, like they're his buddies. Because he's an expert in nuclear weapons. So he, you know, gets around the world. And so anyway, he goes away. He doesn't come back after two weeks. And I say, OK, two weeks, so what? Then I get a call after three weeks. And it's from his girlfriend. David said to call you if I'm not back. And he's not back. So I start talking to her, and we agree to meet. And then I start making a lot of noise on the phone. I said, oh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do it. Within 48 hours, he, he sent an uh, email saying that he's OK. You know, if somebody got word, you know, and, and he sent the email from Pakistan. I had that traced to Pakistan through my friend Joe Matheny. And he could never admit that it was from Pakistan. Apparently, they were sending him over there something to do with the war with the Taliban and for his expertise. And when I met his girlfriend, she says, he has a time travel research center? I didn't know that. <laughs> and she freaked out. She started reading. And of course, um, I became, I'm still good friends with her to this day, although they're no longer together because kind of had to protect her from his strange connections. You know, when you can just have to go away for long periods of time, he's not a, a good candidate in that regard because he works for the company. But he then told me that his, he was having security problems in his center. He had security problems in his center, and 
the government said, look, if you partner with us, we'll get rid of your security problems, which they were obviously causing. He called me in Easter of 2003, around Easter time, before Easter, and he says, I want to give you all my stuff in the Time Travel Research Center, which was mostly a library. He says, I don't know what to do with it. I'm not going to use it. I'm out of the time travel business for right now. They've got this center in New Mexico, but he had a closed one down on Long Island. He had one in Romania, uh, which he said was because they have the best mathematicians in the world in Romania, and their economy was such that they were affordable, very affordable. So he said, I won't be able to work with you for five years. We loaded up Preston's van from his car with all these books in Rochester, New York, and we drove down uh, back with them. And I didn't see him for five years. I get an email from him occasionally. Just a couple of mysterious postcards that were written in code. One, one that was written in code and one that he elaborated on. And he said, then five years to the day, he says, how would you like to go to Romania? We're having a conference. We're having a conference in uh, Atlanticron, it's called. It's, it's a, he'd been sponsoring this thing for years. It's a scientists, writers, artists to help Romanian youth, science fiction writers. It's, a, it's a, on an island in the Danube. He says, would you like to go? Now this, this was right after I'd signed a contract. He wrote me this to, to publish this book, which he put me in touch with some Romanian publishers, and my books got published in Romania. And they sent me a book in 2003, or thereabouts, maybe 2005, it was 2005. It took me three years to read the book because I'm very busy. When I read the book, I said, okay, I'll publish this. It took me three months to work out a contract with my publisher in Romania. And right after I worked this contract out, David says, do you want to go to Romania? I hadn't heard it for five years. I said, sure, so I go. And he calls me up on the phone and says, it's good to talk to you. It's been a long time. I look forward to having long talks with you on the Danube. We've never really had a long talk about some of this stuff. And I said, by the way, do you know the author of this book, Brand New Cinema? I haven't told you what the book's about. He says, no, I don't. oh, I know who you're talking about. I said, do you know him? He says, I don't want to talk about that on the phone. He said, the phone's a mantra. He says, we'll talk about that on the Danube. He says, now, he says, he says uh, we'll talk about that with Danny. So then, I get an email from Radu, which I still haven't told you. He, he works for Romanian Intelligence. And he says, I want to come and talk to you in person in America. I'll feel safe talking to you in America. So he feels safe talking to me in America. David feels safe talking in Romania. <laughs> On an island. Yeah, very funny. So let me tell you a little bit about how Radu Cinema is. Radu Cinemar authored this book called The Enemy Within in Romania. And he was introduced by circumstances, I think he worked in the government already, to a man named, that's called Cesar Brad. And Cesar Brad was born with a very large umbilical cord. They couldn't cut it. And when the doctor couldn't cut it, he eventually did. I think he got a hacksaw or something, but it was, he, he, it was very hard to cut. He reported this oddity to a certain part of the Romanian government, which was then communist. And he went to a special department. Cesar Brad was monitored, and he said to his parents, we will pay you so much money every month, but you have to report anything unusual that he does. The kid was very psychic, and they brought in a doctor, Zen, Zien, X-I-E-N, to monitor him. Dr. Zhen was from Red China. He was part of a cultural uh, exchange program between Red China, which was Red China at the time, and Romania. And they were both communist bloc countries. And in those days, any communist could go anywhere you wanted in the communist bloc. I was also told that you could go anywhere outside of the communist bloc. The only problem was you'd have 12 people following you. <laughs> you know, this is what Romania is for. So anyway, Dr. Zhen was monitoring him, he was very psychic, and, or not psychic, very gifted in, in these sort of things. Probably was psychic. So, Caesar Brad grew up this, this strange youth. He was an anomaly. 
uh, gifted. As he grows up, and they tell this, this, this book tells the story of his life to some extent, as he grows up, he becomes part of what's called the Department of Zebra. There's a General Obadiah, or Colonel Obadiah, who becomes a general who's over him. And Obadiah is, he helps secure funding for this department through a holding company in Uruguay. And uh, he's uh, some mysterious creatures here. And of course, the doctor, or Colonel Obadiah, has to negotiate around the dictator because they have this Department Zero set up, which is like the X-Files department. They're there to study anomalies because they've had people disappear in certain places of Romania, you know, your Bermuda Triangle effect and whatnot. So over the long haul, uh, Caesar Red, the psychic, grows up under General Obadiah, who oversees him. General Obadiah seems like a very good person who has having to negotiate his way through the dictatorship and the eventual transfer of the dictatorship into a capitalist system. And he's still there to this day. And Caesar grows up to be the head of Department Z. Okay? They have a unit come out and scrutinize these events, what happens, and then to send in a certain team, you know, to do certain things. So one day, Caesar is contacted through secret channels diplomatic intelligence channels that he's got to meet with this guy and he's an Italian Freemason of noble lineage whose name is Signor Mazzini and Mazzini is by Caesar's accounts a very evil man and but he says to him he's, he's basically talking about how he has a works for the Bilbo Burger group he's very uh, powerful they can make or break economies. But they can't just bypass Romanian intelligence and Romanian <coughs> presidency altogether. They need his help on something. Says, we need your help. Um, our people in the Pentagon have discovered through imaging technology, pen ground penetrating radar, that underneath the Sphinx in Romania is a chamber that we can't get at. Because you're in charge of this, we want your help and your blessings and in return, we'll give you, you know, anything the devil may grant you. Of course, Caesar does not like these people. He knows what they're up to, but he knows that he has to play along because if he resists them, he'll be removed and Romania will suffer. So he kind of commits without committing. And the long and short of it is, and, and the guy says, don't talk about this to anybody. Don't, don't, don't tell the president. So they use this plasma technology to or into. And this is all through his connections in, in the Secret Service of Romania. And he's telling this story to the author, Radu Sinemar. Meantime, he wants Radu Sinemar to publish this book. So he starts pulling him in on his life and all the stuff that happens. And through, they finally bore into this secret chamber underneath the Sphinx because they saw it. And it, it, it's, it's a room. How did it get inside the mountain? Because it's inside a mountain. It doesn't have an access. And once they get there, um, the stuff hits the fan because when they actually penetrate this chamber, it sends off a signal to a similar device that the Pentagon has already discovered off near Baghdad in Iraq, which would tell you that this is what the war in Iraq was really about. And it's an underground chamber that had a map in it showing the one in Romania going off. So they knew it was going off in Romania. So the Pentagon said, Wow, this is going off in Romania. What's going? What's happening? Not the Pentagon, the U.S. government, the army. So what's going on in Romania? So it gets to the president. The president contacts the, the president of Romania, and they say, "What the hell is going on?" As they say, the stuff hits the fans. It's, it's terrible, and there begins this intense fight between the uh, Romanian and American diplomats. Now, what you will see in the real world is you will now see since that time when this happened in 2003 a convergence of Romania and American diplomacy. They're now buddies. And Romania is now part of NATO. This has actually happened. They won't tell you that it's over this, but it is. Now, Renu Sinemar is invited to go see this chain by Caesar because he wants the author to really see what's there. 
And it's only a few weeks after it's been found. That was in 2003. It's been explored for years, six years later. So Radu goes in there, and he's there's all these troops and stuff he goes by. And it's a mountain, a chamber in the mountain. And there's this, what you call, big table, six foot high. They have to go up on a platform to get it. He puts his hand over it. It would read out his DNA in a holographic projection. It could, if you put it further, it would read out of closer molecules, atoms. He didn't have a whole lot of time to explore because he was just for a dog and pony show. Another one, you could put your hand and it would show alien life forms or combinations if you put your hands of, of alien life forms with human forms or with two alien forms. It would show the star system, what it's from, and it would it give a holographic readout of a film of history that would be tailored to each individual up to 400 AD. After 400 AD, it cut off, ostensibly because they haven't updated the software. So this is like a really bizarre thing. So when I went to Romania last year, I said, David says, what do you want to see? I said, I want to see the Hall of Records. <laughs> he writes it down. Not sure he knew what I was talking about. So he forwards my letter. So he says, write a letter to Redu. So I write a letter to Redu. I thought his people were going to get it. But it actually ends up going to my publisher. That's how they get to Redu. Who only communicates to them by secret courier. And I get a letter from Redu saying, Oh, I'm glad you're going to publish my book. Da, 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 da. I can't meet with you because there's too much security. I will come see you in America someday. Someday he will pop in on me. But it will be in America, he says. And this is an incredible story. And of course, I went over there to Romania. And uh, because we're running out of time, I'll, I'll quickly get to the point. I went to Romania. I saw David. I hadn't seen him. Seen him for, I, when I got to go to the Sphinx, I, this was an incredible experience. There's megaliths around there, uh, a place called Babel. It's got uh, stones coming out. And uh, this, this place is right underneath it. I was told that if you go a certain mile away from the Sphinx, you'll see all these Romanian military installations, and they'll send you back. I didn't try to penetrate their secret. But I, I got to meet David, and David was very nice. And he says, I'm not going to be able to talk to you much because I'm busy with this project. But you know, but I eat dinner with him and I talk. And finally, when it got down to the subject with Radu, he was he started avoiding me. David started avoiding me. And I eventually got sick, very sick, because I wasn't getting any, any information. My body was revolting. I wasn't intellectually sick. I was revolting. And so I spent a day away from the camp and he's he spent the next afternoon with me and apologized. He says, I can't talk to you about some of these things because I have a merger going on. I'm going to get the Time Travel Research Center back. It's a new company called Anderson Multinational, which you can see on the web, Anderson Multinational. He doesn't play up the technology he's doing, but things are going better than ever. But I can't talk about it because I have mergers and deals on the line. I have verbal handshakes. He says, you can print this stuff, but that's about it, what I say. Um, he later provided me with a little bit more information. But then I had an audio CD given to me by Radu, the author, that I was supposed to listen to. And I listened to it, and the first thing he says, don't let anybody hear this but yourself. And then he went on to talk about stuff that's already in the book. I didn't really learn anything new from the book. Until the end of the tape, and he says, there's only one person I want you to share with, is David Anderson. I trust him, and I'd like to meet him someday. Because he read my newsletters. And so I went up to David, and I said, Radu wants you to hear this CD. He's you're the only one he wants to hear it. Uh, I'll send you a copy when I get to uh, get back home. And David said, it's funny. He says, many people have told me that I know Radu. He smiled. But he apparently doesn't know. So it's like this parallel connection. And I haven't really gotten a ch question, a chance. I'm hoping to go back to Romania this summer. He re-invited me back, but they ran out of funds because of the economic hard times. So I'm, I'm trying to raise funds through my newsletter and whatnot to, to go back um, and you know visit a little bit more. But that's, that's in a nutshell what this book is about.
it turns out that Dr. Zen, in, it's, it's mentioned in this book, although it's in a future book, because there's three other books he's written, which are in Romanian, I haven't even read. Dr. Zen is actually a, a Tibetan law that was posing as a red Chinese doctor. And it gets it, it actually, this is the funniest update, because he said that Caesar, uh, he says, Red wrote me a letter, it says, I'm sorry that Caesar is leaving me. He's going into the inner earth to be an ambassador. Because they found three tunnels in the chamber. One goes to Egypt, where he says there's a similar facility under the Sphinx. There's another facility in Baghdad, which I already talked about. And one goes to Tibet and, and, and has a side, uh, side tunnel to Mongolia. So Caesar has apparently left. He didn't get a copy of this book before he left, though. And Caesar acknowledged it. But uh, it's, very, it's, it's interesting to have uh, strange friends in strange places. <laughs> and whether, he, you know, whether any of this stuff is even true, I cannot prove it. I would say, if I had to bet that it was true, I'd say it's mostly true. You know? Um, and it's a very interesting, that's what, this is kind of what my next few years of my life will probably be doing the sequels to this, which I don't have to write them, but I hope to add to them as I added to this book, writing the, the forward and afterwards. Um, so that's, you know, we're about at the, you know. We have about five minutes. So if anybody, I mean, that's basically as much as I can squeeze in. I can actually give a six, eight hour talk if my voice will hold out. I got enough information. But anybody have any questions? I do. You know what I know because you talked about ejaculation. It's a, I mean, female ejaculation right. is a lost art. I know it's in Africa where they do the mutilations to the women. Right. That's also a lost part, but it's, that lost part is forced on these women right. in Africa. Can you? Well, I, I haven't studied that. I've heard that they do this as a mutilation so as to prevent that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Because although I, there is a, uh, somebody had, had once reported that the only virgin births occurring were in black tribes of Africa. Um, I've heard that. I, it's not substantiated, but it would stand to reason. And I think it probably has to do that to stop it from occurring, I would imagine. I mean, to stop it from occurring, but you said it's a heart. I mean, because... Not the mutilation. I mean, but, not, not the but mutilation. The, but no, the cultivation. No, the, you know, ejaculation. Right, the, the cultivation. Of but I, I noticed that it's, it's forced on them in Africa. And, and I, what I want to know is, how did it get to Africa? And when did they start doing that in Africa? And was it really a black thing at first? Or was that put there by another culture that came to that place? Well, according to this one tradition, it would be from the Atlantean culture. But they could have been doing it on their own, too. Because you have a very rich, mysterious culture in Africa that goes down to the Merrill civilization of, uh, what is that? I don't even remember the country. It's south of Nubia. Does anybody know what the country? What's, what's, the, what's that? What's the, the marrow with the pyramids down there? What's that? Oh, Moreau. It's my ancient Kosh. Ancient yes. Kush. 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 Yes. Yeah. yeah, Kosh is the real name, but the Western oh, terminology is Kush. But Moreau was there, yeah. Right. I mean, there's a lot of wisdom. Which is apparent to ancient Canada, much older. Yeah, there's a lot of wisdom there that I couldn't pretend, I mean, to know which came, which started first, the chicken or the egg. You know, but there's just a, a very rich. You go for the chicken. Well, the egg might have been something else before it was a chicken. <laughs> it was an egg. Yes. Were you while you were over in Romania? Did they explain in any way, shape, or form how the time cycle was being changed uh, for? not only Romania, but uh, also for the world. Um, they did not explain that, but I was told that they, as the conference would get deeper, David told me that as it would get deeper into the week, it would have more to do with astropaleontology, or no, astropaleology, which is stones and time, with stones lining up with stars which has to do with the name of the conference, which is Atlanticron, which is time in Atlantis, the time of Atlantis. In other words, these stones will wake us up to the time uh, when uh, to old Atlantean culture and is coming back, it's kind of regenerating. And there's a huge set of stone that would make Stonehenge look 
Mickey Mouse by comparison. It's called Sarmisegetusa. This is the ancient Dacian capital, which has all these incredible uh, calendar. That's where I hope to go this year. It's, uh, it's you can see it on the web. It's beautiful, but it's it's basically unknown even by what you call your. My friend David Childress, he never heard of this place, and he's Mr. Archaeology, Mr. Forbidden Archaeology. So, you know, just the times are changing, not specifically our wind. Yes? Was Elrond Hubbard a high ranking Freemason? I don't think so. I've, I've heard uh, one or two rumors to that effect, but he had no. Uh, Any ties to Elvis Crowley? He, he had uh, studied Alistair Crowley, yes. Not, I mean, it's so many people, he never met him. He was, he studied with Jack Parsons, who was in Alistair Crowley. That's where, right. not all, but most of his Crowley stuff comes from. And I, I wouldn't uh, venture to say he was not a Freemason at all. In fact, I'm quite sure of it. Yes. When did the Moors become Arab? The Arabs, when Mohammed came, he invaded all of the Northern Africa, and everybody in Northern Africa had to pay lip service to the to the uh, Muslims. Because if you didn't, you wouldn't survive. So the Berber people and the Moors adopted this culture. Because if you didn't adopt the culture, you would die. So you know, it was like you pay lip service. And, you know, so that was in 700 AD, and it caught on like wildfire. They were still African. When did they become Arab? Arab-looking image. That I, that I, I mean, it's it's an admixture. See, the one thing about the Moorish culture, and I first learned this in a movie called The Long Ships. With yeah. Sidney Poitier. Sidney Poitier. Sidney Poitier and Richard Winbar. Is as I was seeing this as a kid, and, and I said that they, they make no distinction. That the Moors have white people. Why why is there no distinction? I didn't understand. And my father explained that they had no, they didn't care about color. The Moors didn't care about color. So it was a non-issue. And you have the Tauric people, which are the blue race of today in the Sahara. They have tended to mix, they were, they come from a blue queen, but they had white people. They're kind of an admixture now, a very beautiful admixture. Um, but, you know, color was not an issue. Slaves could be white or black. It didn't, slaves existed in those days, but it wasn't a color issue. It was a I guess an economic issue. They just had a different attitude than, than we have today, or than 100 years ago. When you mentioned the blue princess just now, RH negative is copper based blood? Yes, RH negative, well, originally, so you would, originally, you have, originally was based upon copper based blood. So you would have iron, you'd have, you have copper attracting oxygen in the blood? Yeah, it was originally, the, the Martian race was supposed to be copper based blood, and you see it in, in words like like even like Coptic, right? Or Kiosk. You know, you have a root root etymology. Um, you know, I mean, people that are Rh negative don't have flagrantly copper based blood. You know, because but they're uh, original. Bio, this, this shows up in something called Wilson's disease, which is the name Wilson coming in, which is is too much copper. You know, you're 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 excreting too much copper through your liver. Your liver gets balled up. Yeah, I think because humans are, are what iron based, and then I, I read that reptilian blood would be like a, a copper wedge. Um, I don't know if it shows up in reptiles, it shows up in shellfish. Shellfish. Copper based blood. Put your hands together for Dr. Pierce. Mm -hmm. Good man.